rejoice with our Savior and His presence in our lives. Today's message is on stinking thinking. I've mentioned this before. I've preached on this very topic before, but maybe not from this angle. And it's definitely something that as Christians, we need to be completely aware of. Because our, our thinking, our thoughts that we think throughout the day shape the way that we behave, yeah. shape the way that we treat other people, um, shapes the way that we interact with God, especially if our thinking is in air about how God sees us, about how we see God, about how our relationship is formed and maintained. So I want to start off this morning on this topic of stinking thinking in the gospel of Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, it says this, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Now in this particular passage, the context is Jesus is trying to reason with the Pharisees. And you guys know it's not easy to reason with Pharisees. They're one-track-minded people. They're self-righteous people. And But anyway, he's trying to reason with the Pharisees after they accuse Jesus. And now they're pointing fingers at Jesus, accusing him of obtaining power from Satan to cast out an evil spirit in one of their local men. Jesus just cast out a, a, an evil spirit. And they basically pointed at Jesus and said, you only were able to do that because you have the power of the evil one. And Jesus says, uh, don't you guys know that every kingdom divided against itself won't stand? Basically saying what Jesus is reasoning with them is that God has his agenda, right? And as we've already prayed for this morning, God is the giver of life. Um, and he is for life. He's not for death. And what Jesus reasons is that God has his agenda and Satan has his agenda and they are on polar ends of the spectrum. Amen. What God wants is completely opposite of what Satan wants. And what Satan wants, completely opposite of what God wants. And, and Jesus is trying to tell the Pharisees that it, it doesn't compute. If I was using the power of Satan to cast out an evil spirit, and yet I call myself God, a house divided can't stand. I can't be at one end of the spectrum and at the other end at the same time. It doesn't make sense because it would jeopardize the agenda of either God or Satan. During our country's civil war, you can say that we were a house divided, amen? The North versus the South, brother vetted against brother. Can you imagine that? Your brother lives across the Mason-Dixon line and you're fighting in a war against him. The country was split. Recent political pundits say that our country right now is at polar opposites, split. But during our country's civil war, then President Abraham Lincoln quoted this verse from Matthew 12 when he was at the Republican convention in 1865 he said this a house divided against itself cannot stand and then he went on i believe this govern government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free i do not expect the union to be dissolved i do not expect the house to fall but i do expect it will cease to be divided it will become it will become all one thing or all the other it's not something so he used Matthew 25 to equate what was happening is we had Christians on both sides of the war. Both of them standing up for what they thought was right. So here we see it applied to a country that was divided on slavery. Lincoln basically said you can't have it both ways. You can only serve one master faithfully. Either we're going to be free people or we're going to be in slavery. All right, let's go back to God's application with Matthew 12. Back to God's application, how it applies to you and me. You are not a divided person. You are not a divided person. 
You're not half one way and half the other. You are not two people. You do not have two hearts. You are not two selves. Like Lincoln said, you're not half slave and half free. Do you get what happened to you and me at salvation? We were a slave to sin. But by the blood of Jesus Christ, he set us free. Amen. And now we are free men. Amen. We have liberty in Jesus Christ. We're not still half foot in slavery of sin and half foot in liberty in Jesus. We're not two people. We're not divided. But brother, I, I feel the struggle. The struggle's real in the Christian's life. There is a war, there is a battle that we're fighting, but it's not against you. You are one person. You are one heart. You're not two selves. You're not half good and half bad. It's not against you. It's against the flesh. Something that is not you, something that is completely untrustworthy. You cannot trust the flesh, period. Amen. You see, you are now a single person united with Christ. You are on God's team. That's what we're going to do in just a little bit. We're going to take communion, celebrating our unification with God. We're holding hands. We're on the same team. We have one heart with God. United with Christ on God's team, and you can trust what God has done to you. What has he done to you? He gave you his heart. Can you trust the heart that God gave you? Absolutely. It's trustworthy. It's trustworthy. You cannot trust the flesh, the world, or the enemy, but you can trust the heart of God, which is in you. Listen, we know our attitudes. We know our behaviors aren't perfect, period. Maybe you had an attitude problem this morning when you woke up. First time I woke up, I did. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. I said, I want to go back to bed. I didn't have a good attitude. Finally, I went back to sleep. But we know our attitudes and behaviors aren't perfect. We are learning and growing in God's grace. So what's the, what happens when we fail? Because we do fail. We do fail. The flesh seizes the moment and begins to run the old software program called the flesh. Seizes that moment and says, what are you going to do? Do this. Starts running that old software program that equates who you are with what you do. What does that look like? Well, let's say you failed. You failed to live up to a standard that you said you were going to live up to. And you failed. The flesh pops in and says, you know what you are? You're a failure. Do you hear me? You're a failure. You sin. The flesh pops in and says, you know what you are? You're a sinner. You sinner. You lust. Flesh pops in and tells you you're a fornicator. You're nothing but a dirty, nasty fornicator. You had a critical spirit or hated somebody. And the flesh pops and says, you know what you are? You're a murderer at heart. How could you think evil thoughts about someone like that? Aren't you supposed to be a good Christian? You're a hateful, critical, nasty person. Hmm. You guys see how quick that can happen? See how the flesh can pop in and start telling you things about yourself that just aren't true? Who are you listening to? Stop listening to the stinking thinking. It's not you. Amen. It's not you. It's the flesh. And you are not the flesh. These messages are not from God. Back to the Bible to discover who would want you to believe such whisperings. 
See, it's all about that failure and accusation. If you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ do something and we equate what we do with who we are, we're going to be in trouble because we will fail. We will lust. We will, we will uh, hate. We will gossip. We will have jealous thoughts. But just because we have a thought doesn't mean that's who we are. And there's lots of fingers pointing at us. And oftentimes we point our own fingers at ourselves. But it's not coming from God. Who would be pointing fingers at us? Who would be trying to tear us down? Revelation 12 gives us some insight. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Look at this. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Who is accusing you? The accuser. When does he do it? 24-7. He doesn't miss an opportunity to accuse you and tell you that you're something that God said you're not anymore. Amen. You see, God gave you a new heart. The thoughts are not from you. The thoughts are not from God. They're from somebody else. The accuser. Look again in John 8, 44. Ye, and this is described in Satan, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and a father of it. Who would be telling you a lie? The person who is a liar. Who would be calling you a murderer? The one who is a murderer. It's not from, it's not from God. This is from Satan. It's Satan utilizing the flesh to make you believe that you are the culprit. You're the problem. And you walk away defeated, saying, you know what? I'm a bad Christian. I can't think of a positive thought if I had to. It's the accuser of the brother. Don't take the bait. God has changed you. Now, that's what the accuser is telling you. What's God telling you? Because we still fail. We don't have perfect behavior. We don't have perfect attitudes. What is God saying to you and me? What's God telling you when you mess up? The truth is God is a truth teller, unlike Satan. The truth is we are not the sum total of our behaviors. You are not what you do. Remember, our identity is through birth. When we got born again, we became children of God. Not because we did something, but because we believed in Jesus who did. Amen. So when we fail, we're not a sum total of our behaviors. But you're not a failure. You failed, but you're not a failure. You get it? You sinned, but you're not a sinner. You're a saint. And it's out of character for you to sin. Amen. You behave in a way like somebody you are not. Christians don't do this. That's why it's not fitting. That's why it bothers us. God's comforting voice reminds you who you are, a child of God. That's what he says when you messed up. Hey, you're my child. This isn't you. This isn't what you're designed for. This is out of your character. Now, remember whose you are. God would say, you're mine. Now, go and sin no more. Because children of God don't sin. 
So first he takes us back to our rebirth. He takes us back to our salvation. He says, do you know who you are? You're right. I'm a child of God. So what you just did, is that what child of God does? No. You know what a child of God does? Yes. Go and sin no more. That's a comforting voice, not an accusing voice. Oh, no, you messed up again. Can't you get anything right? How many times have I told you not to do that? That's not God. That's somebody else. God's voice is comforting, reassuring, and affirming. Takes you back to square one, reminds you whose you are, reminds you of all the wonderful things that he's placed inside your heart, and then he tells you to live from your heart. Don't live from the flesh. But what happens if you've harmed another person in the course of your bad behavior or attitude? Because we hurt each other. We say things that we regret. We do things that are harmful to others. You know what God's company voice says? If that happens, don't worry. We'll walk through this together. We'll make it right. Do you trust him? This is the voice of Jesus, the counselor, the guide into all truth. God's wisdom works with your heart, not against it. You're okay. Your heart's okay. God works with your heart, not against it. He's not saying you're a bad person. He killed the bad person at salvation. It's dead and in the ground. Do you believe that this morning? He directs us all away from sin, not towards it. He directs us away from sin, which harms us and harms others. So what does God want us to do then? He wants you to change the station. That's all. Just change the station. I can remember traveling in the car and operating the radio and some music would come on that my parents would disagree with. And the first thing they'd say, change the station. Okay, I changed the station. Today we have a term called fake news, made popular by a former president. Fake news, but fake news has been around for a long time. We always thought historically the news was truthful and accurate. You could trust what the news anchor was saying behind that coveted desk. Not anymore. Now we follow the money, right? Who owns the station? Who owns that station and where are they on the political spectrum? Because that's what is going to be heard on that station. And now we see news stations divided. Two news stations could be covering the exact same event. One station tells the event one way, you change the station, go to another station, and they're saying something completely different about the same event and how they see it. Some say our nation is divided. And you got your favorite station. You're going to watch the station that agrees with your point of view. You're going to not watch the other station. Well, there are two stations in your mind vying for your attention, vying for your loyalty. Two stations. Station number one is your old flesh, the old heart that is dead and in the ground, and the dead you, which the Bible says is dead and in the ground. Yet the echoes are still there. The old software is still running, still trying to get your attention, still trying to tell you this is how you survive in life. This is what you must do in order to make it. And then there's this new station. It's God's spirit, which is in your spirit. It's God's heart, which is your new heart, and it's the new you. It's the new self. Station one reminds you of your past, your formative years, your tutelage, and all the people that instructed you, and systems that instructed you, and tells you 
that you are a product of them. You guys get this? That's what the flesh is telling you. You are a product of your history. The family that you grew up in, the town that you grew up in, your educational background, your lack of educational background, your economic standing. If your past is defined by failure, that's what it's telling you. You're a big fat failure. If your background is defined by success, if you had an upstanding, well-to-do family, well, then it's telling you that you're well-to-do and you're upstanding. See, the flesh doesn't matter if you're a total failure or a great success. It's telling you you're one of those things based on what you did. You're it's either going to be a past of abuse that you grew up with or a past of oodles and oodles of affirmation, people patting you on the head and patting you on the back and telling you you're a good boy or a good girl. And you start to think, I'm a good boy or I'm a good girl or I'm not a good boy or I'm a bad girl. Your current possessions. What do you have? You look around. You got a lot or you got little. You got a little. You're a failure. You got a lot. I'm, I'm good to go. Your current possessions and cumulative background reveal, reveal your comparative worth. Drive by someone's house and you say, wow, look at that. Look at all that they got. Big house, new stuff, lots of land, lots of possessions, perfect wife, perfect kids. And then we compare ourselves to them. Are we better than them or not so better? And then we start, I'm, I'm not as good as them. I'm a failure. I haven't made it in life. Or if you're at the top, I've made it. I'm better than everybody. It's the flesh talking. It's the flesh talking. As we listen to this programming, and this is what the flesh does. Remember, it's from the world, the enemy. It's worldly thinking. As we listen to this program, we begin to identify either with our guilt or shame, and even with our self-striving and material success. Flesh makes it all about you. Flesh makes it all about you and your success in life or your failure in life. And all of a sudden, this is how we identify. Station two, however, invites the listener to hold fast to the new heart within them. To dismiss the fleshly knee-jerk reactions, to dismiss the old habits, the old thinking patterns, and revelations, and invite you to say, you know what? Where are these thoughts coming from? Where are these fleshly thoughts in my mind coming from? On station number two, you are told that you are clean, that you're filled with God's Holy Spirit. You are told that you are forgiven, you're loved, and that you are free. <laughs> On station number two, you are being invited to wake up every day and simply be who you are. <laughs> and not strive to be something that the world says you need to become. Two stations in your head, which one are you going to tune into? Yeah. One's going to bring peace in your life. The other's going to be bring strife. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Simply put, God wants to renew your mind. He wants you to tune into his station. 
He wants to renew your mind as to who you are. Because the flesh is constantly telling you somebody you are not. Who are you listening to? God wants to renew your mind. See, it's all about your self-image. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? <laughs> when you look in the mirror, what are you saying about you? I've had days when I've looked in the mirror and I have not said nice things about myself. And everything that I said about myself was the exact opposite of what the truth was. Can we wake up enough to realize that the accuser is trying to get us at our core? But our core is already secure. Jesus is there. And he is screaming at the top of his lungs. Don't listen to him. Amen. That, that part of you is dead and gone. I made you a new you. Listen to my voice. Listen to my voice. God wants what you hear to be truthful and accurate. Whether your past is muddled with failure after failure or success after success. It's not about you. It's about him. And what he has made you. How do we obtain accuracy when it comes to self-image? Because the messages are out there. The world is relentless. The accuser is relentlessly trying to tell you. You are something you're not. And trying to alter the self-image that God has given us. First, we need to be steadfast in seeking God's perspective of who we are. Because that's the reality for you and me. Don't listen to the world. Listen to the, the tr truth teller. We have to be steadfast. We have to be adamant about seeking about what God says you and I are. And throw out all the other junk. Dismiss it. Secondly, we need to change the channel as often as necessary and do not listen to the false messages as it is a trap and baiting you for discouragement and failure. There's a reason Satan is whispering these thoughts into your mind. Because he knows that if you and I believe the truth about who God says we are, there's no stopping what we can do for the kingdom. Yet if he can get one foothold in and discourage you and tell you you're somebody you're not, guess who you're going to be worried about all day long? You. Just you. Good. I got her. She's off on her own rabbit trail. She's not thinking about anybody else but her own failure self. She won't tell no one about Jesus today. Score for Satan. Do you guys see what he's doing? Change the channel. Don't listen to that message even one moment. God wants you to ignore those messages. Listen to his. Look what he says in Romans chapter 6. Likewise, follow along with me. Likewise. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See what he's telling you to listen to? Don't listen to those sin messages. You're alive to me. You're dead to sin. Why would you even listen to what Satan has to say? You're set free from him, and now you're free to worship me. Amen. Let not sin, therefore, this is logical. Therefore, because you're set free, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that ye should obey the lust thereof. What happens when we start listening to the messages from Satan? We begin to obey him. And he's no longer our master, right? Not anymore. So why would we do it? Because it's familiar. People have told me I'm a failure my whole life. They're probably right. Not anymore. You might fail, but God will never call you a failure. I'm a great success. We start thinking we did it. Listen to what God has said. You're allowed to change the channel. Don't entertain or ponder or get this, Christian. 
analyze the thoughts that sin offers you. Sinful thought comes in your mind. Why am I thinking that? I wonder why I'm thinking that. And we start to analyze it and think about it and think about it. Guess what happens to that sinful thought? Begins to marinate. Begins to find a home in your mind. And you can bring it up again and bring it up again. Could be a hateful thought. Maybe someone that hurt you years ago. Why am I, what, why am I thinking about this person? That was 10 years ago. And then you keep thinking about it. You keep thinking about it. Guess what happens to your emotions? Start hating that person again. Man, I hated that person. Man, I want to do something. Good. Man, I need to get them back. See what happens? God said, don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. And don't be surprised that you get simple thoughts, Christian. But I'm supposed to be saying, God, clean me. He made me whole again. Why am I thinking these stinking thoughts? Don't be surprised. Any Christian, anytime, anywhere can get any thought. <laughs> Bless you, my sister. Bless you, my sister. I can remember as a young man having a bad thought sitting in the church pew. And I shook my head because I, I had wrong thinking. I thought that these four walls of a building were holier than outside these four walls. I thought it was a, 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 a double sin to have an evil thought sitting in a church pew rather than sitting in a seat at school. And then the truth, I found out that I'm the church. That what we're sitting in is not a sanctuary, it's an auditorium. And there's nothing special about these four walls that make it more holy or more punishment if we do something evil in these four walls rather than doing it on the outside of these four walls. And then I shook my head in that pew and said, I'm a bad boy. I can't even have a holy thought while sitting in the pew around Christians after I just got done singing hymns. What's wrong with me? I'm a failure. And Satan got a hold of me right in that pew. I thought I was supposed to be protected at church. Don't be surprised, Christian. You can get any thought anywhere, anytime about anything. Billy Graham has had bad thoughts. Amen. Amen. God encourages us to move on. Don't dwell on thought. Don't analyze a thought. Don't ask yourself over and again, why, 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 why am I thinking this? God encourages us to move on, to fill up on truth and ignore the lies. We've all encountered a Christian who quickly shares their struggles with us. Well, I've been, I'm, I've been struggling with this for, and they give you how many years they've been struggling with it. And they spent plenty of time analyzing their struggles. And guess what? They continue to struggle with it. You see what analyzing your sin does for you? Not much. Not much on the positive side. Because they sit there and dwell all day long about their struggles. And tell everyone about their struggles. I'm not saying that's wrong. To tell others. But when you sit and analyze it all day, what are you focused on? You focus on Jesus or you focus on your sin? You're focused on your sin. It's not what God wants us to focus on. Don't analyze over and over why. You end up being sin-focused all day long. But keep your focus spirit-centered, Christ-centered. Be Christ-conscious because you are not your sinful thoughts. You are not your sinful thoughts. We have a new default setting that now that we're saved, it's a whole new way to think and a whole new way to behave. So when a thought runs down our mind's corridor, when a, when a thought that is not from God runs down the hallway of your mind, like a lustful thought or a greedy thought or a hateful or a critical thought or a jealous thought or a oh, gossipy thought, we are called to say, I am dead to that thought. 
and I am alive to God. I am dead to that thought, and I am alive to God. Sin does not fit with who I am. And then we replace that stinking thinking, and we change the channel. But what about feelings, brother? Sometimes I feel like I want to sin. It's hard to do what's right. Talking to the teenage boy of myself. It's hard to do what's right. Sometimes I feel like I want to sin. We know there will be resistance from the flesh when we want to do what's right. There will be resistance. Expect it. But we have to consider our heart's desire. And this is the truth that we have to dwell on. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But God be thanked. Look at this. That ye past tense were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. The new station. You were formerly servants of sin, but God gave you a new heart. And now you can obey from that new heart, the new station. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. We are now a slave servant to righteousness. And guess what? It's inescapable. It's inescapable. You can't stop being a servant of righteousness. That's your new default setting. You can't go back and change it. God changed it. And he is unchangeable. You can't go back to not being a Christian anymore. What if I do a whole bunch of bad stuff? Doesn't matter what you do. Remember, you're not a sum total of what you do. You are who you are because of birth. You were born the first time into Adam, and you served Adam, and you served sin, and you served Satan. And then you were born again by birth into Jesus, and now you serve Jesus. You can't change that. Amen. You can't change that. As a believer, as a new creation, we want what God wants, whether you like it or not. Whether your feelings like it or not. <laughs> You want what God wants, whether you like it or not. And by the way, you like it. By the way, you like it. Amen? Amen, brother. Amen. I wanted to 